Good morning. If you are here in the room right now or watching online, what's up? It's Pastor Cal. Pastor Ernie is uh, on vacation celebrating his 50-year wedding anniversary. I think his wife is also celebrating too. I presume that. I think that that's healthy to do. And um, wish him well, and we'll see him again next Sunday. We are in Romans chapter 4 this morning, Romans chapter 4, 1 through 12. And we'll have it up on the screens, but I'm going to read it to you. Now, we are a little bit in the weeds this morning, okay? So my front yard, I have some kind of like weed attack, and it's driving me crazy. And I've got a warm season grass, so it turns brown in the winter and goes to sleep, and now it's green and awake, but it's mixed with weeds. And I'm going to kill them, but I'm in the weeds, okay? And I know that there is beautiful zoysia grass in that weed mixture that will come back and grow once I get it taken care of. So we're in the weeds this morning, Romans. Just be patient, because there is good grass in there to be found, okay? So Romans 4, 1 through 12. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then, he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is then also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. You see, I told you we'd be in the weeds this morning. So now you know, and it's okay, because we're going to go through it together, and we're going to explain everything, and we're going to parse it out, okay? So Romans was written to a church in Rome by a man named Paul. And the church in Rome was composed of Gentiles, non-Jews, who had believed that Jesus Christ was the Savior of the world, that anyone could have forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. And then Jews who had become Christians and and believed that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah and they could also have forgiveness of sins through him as well. So it was a Jewish and a non-Jewish church, but they all had Jesus Christ in common as a center of their belief. And Paul is explaining to them, how does one come to faith in Jesus Christ that leads to life change and forgiveness of sins? And he uses the Jewish scriptures and Abraham as the piece of evidence to make the point. Now, Abraham to a Jew is like George Washington to America. You know, are there other great presidents? Absolutely. Lincoln stands out, clearly. But Washington was the first president, and when you, you are the one to do it, you know, originally, you are kind of like the OG, you might say, right? Okay, never mind. So George Washington is kind of like the intellectual, spiritual father of what like an ideal American is. And Abraham was the intellectual, spiritual father, archetype, ideal for what a Jew ought to be. So verse 1, what did Abraham discover about how you have a relationship with God, about how you are saved, you might say? He was not justified by works because that would give him a 
thing to be arrogant about, to boast about, right? What does Scripture say in the Bible? In Genesis chapter 15, 6, it says that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, what did Abraham believe? Well, God had told Abraham, Abraham, leave your homeland in Mesopotamia and go to this new land called the Promised Land and I will plant you there. I'll make you wealthy. I'll prosper you. I will give you a chosen child. You see, Abraham and his wife couldn't have kids and they were old. And God provided a child to them through his power alone. And so God made these promises to Abraham. You would have children. That child will be a great nation, will come from him. And through that nation that God will bless and change the world. And the Bible clearly says that Abraham believed in God's promise and it was credited to him as righteousness. So righteousness is a right or proper standing between two parties, two groups. So you got God and you got Abraham. Abraham had a right standing with God. And how did that happen? Because he believed in God, he had faith in the promises and the plans and the purposes of God. And so God gave him a proper relationship with himself, Abraham to God, as a credit, right? Now, credit cards, almost a dirty word in church, you know what I'm saying? Credit cards can be kind of dangerous because you can buy something you want on credit and later on you have to pay it back. And the credit card company gives you the card and the money to buy what you want and they want you to pay the money back to them. And when you don't pay it back, you pay a fee, a penalty for that. And you have to pay it to them and normally you pay it with a lot of interest attached. So credit cards, you know, be careful. But so Abraham got righteousness from God by faith on credit. So somehow the way that he got righteousness would be like a dress later on. Someone has to pay for it, right? And so works, all works means is for a Jew, being circumcised, keeping the Sabbath, keeping all the law of Moses in the Bible, you know, law of ceremony, purification, eat the right stuff, dress the right way, keep the right religious holidays. It's human action that you do that may get you to a right standing with God. And so what Paul says here is that Abraham was not justified, legally made right with God by anything that he did. Rather, he was justified or made right with God according to believing and trusting in the plans and the promises of God. And Abraham's belief led to him being declared righteous by God as a credit. So somehow God was going to bring that to completeness, okay? So now, for the one that works, that you do moral good things, if you think you are doing good things to get to, to God by your own effort then for God to declare you righteous would not be something that he um, chooses to do, but he would have to do because when you work, you, you get paid, right? And so Paul's argument is when you claim that you can get to God by how good you are or how hard you try or by being a Jew or whatever else, what you were actually saying is that I'm the one in control and God owes me. I'm the captain now and God's accountable to what I want for him, you know, for me. That's what you're saying, right? And so Paul's argument is when you don't try to work to get to God, but you simply believe in God, that you are ungodly and God is what you need, that God justifies you, makes you right with himself, makes you uh, righteous by your faith. So you believe and God changes you. You just trust in God's plan, and God makes things right. That's Paul's argument. And he bolsters the argument by, you know, by going, who's even cooler to the Jews than Abraham? Maybe only King David, a man after God's own heart. And he quotes from Psalm chapter 32, and he says, Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Now, you are a blessed man or person. When God forgives what you do wrong, you are blessed when God covers your sins as if they never were and you have a good standing with God. You are blessed when the Lord never counts your sin against you. Interestingly, this idea of never counting your sin against you, the root word for that in Hebrew is related to the word for credited in Genesis. So both for Abraham and for 
David. They trust in God, they believe in God, and God will address, handle the problem of their sin and make an account for it, repay it. Okay, so how? Now, here's how. God sent Jesus, and Jesus gave his life on the cross for our sins. So he paid for the sin problem of Abraham. He paid for the sin problem of David. And although Abraham lived around 2000 B.C. and David, he lived around 1000 B.C. And Jesus lived around, well, A.D. 1, okay? That was a joke. Jesus paid for their sin, made them right with God, righteous with God, and all they did was trust in the plans and the purposes and the promises of God as they knew God in their time. Okay, so now, under what circumstance was Abraham, was he given the credit of righteousness? Was it after he was circumcised? And all that means is being a Jew, right? Circumcision was the primary external mark of what it meant to be a Jew. It was on the outside. It was clear for all to see. It was a present change that could not be hidden away, if you get what I'm saying here. And so all it meant was if a Jew was circumcised, they are different. They are set apart from the people around them. And who are they with? They're with God. They bear a mark on themselves that they are the people of God. That's the idea. And so you would think that, yes, Abraham was commanded by God to be circumcised, so maybe he believed in God after he was circumcised and God gave him credit of righteousness. Interestingly, that isn't the case. Abraham lived before the law of Moses. Abraham believed in God before he was circumcised. There was nothing about Abraham and anything that he did that would make him a Jew in any possible way. There was no thing that he did that you could possibly, you know, like look at him and go, was he working to get to God? Instead, all Abraham did was he had simple, lasting, real faith. That's Paul's argument. And then he says, so that means that Abraham is the father of faith for the non-Jew and for the Jew. And if people live and act like Abraham, they're going to have a relationship with God. But when you think you can get to God on your own by being a really good wife or a really good husband or a really good father or mother or a really good worker or any kind of thing you seek to, in your life to accomplish, whatever you do, it will always fall short because what God wants is for you to believe and trust him. And that is so hard. That is so harder than doing stuff. It's to be changed, to be different, okay? So the main idea of the passage is that Abraham is the model for Christian faith. So if you walk out of here and you understand one thing today, this is it. Abraham is the model of Christian faith, that God made himself known to Abraham. Abraham believed in God and trusted God as Abraham knew him. And he is our spiritual father in that sense. He is the example for how we are to believe and trust in God. Okay, so, but Abraham was saved, made righteous with God based on his faith. So you are saved by faith. That's point one, okay? So you are saved by faith. Not by what you do so you can boast and go look at what I did. You are saved only by faith. Faith in what? Well, faith in the work and the plan and the promises of God. So what is the only work that will actually save you? It's not your work. It's God's work. And here's what the Bible says. John 6, 28 through 29. John 6, 28 through 29. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent. What must we do, Jesus, to get to God? And Jesus, he says, the work of God is this, you believe in the one that God has sent. Believe in me. So what does it mean to believe in Jesus? Well, it means that you're saying he's your rabbi, he's your teacher. And if he is your teacher, then you are his student. It means that he's your prophet, a messenger from God. And if he is a message from God, you better pay attention. It means that he is the son of God, the one uniquely equipped to enact the plan of his heavenly father. Jesus is the way. Jesus has the truth. Jesus has the life in himself and his ministry. 
It means that he's your savior, which means you needed to be saved from something. The fact that you're dead in your sins, you've gone your own way, you've strayed from God, and he is the way for you to get back to God. Not what you do, what God has done through him. And all you have to do is believe it and take it into your life. And it means that he is your Lord and King, making you his servant or slave. He's the captain now, and you are on his ship. He is the Lord, and he is the King. So you are saved by faith in Jesus. And that means you believe in him, you give your life to him, where he is the master, and you are not in control of your present or your destiny. Okay, now, faith precedes works, point number two. So you're saved by faith, and now faith precedes works. And all that means is, before you try to do anything, the most important thing is to get the ultimate thing right, and that is your life with God. So people approach life, and it isn't a bad way to approach it. At least you're asking questions. They go, well, who am I, right? Who am I? And maybe God exists, but who am I in relation to God? And I appreciate the quest for truth and for God, but really the healthier way to look at it is to go, does God exist? And if he does, who is God? Who is God and who is God in relation to me? So Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, Cal created the heavens and the earth. That's not right. In the beginning, our God created the heavens and the earth. It begins with God, it's here because of God, and it will end with God. So who is God, and who is God in relation to me? Let me show you from history a way this happens. Now, Pastor Cal said, right, we're in the weeds, we're getting out of it. Why would you throw us more into the weeds, Pastor Cal? I promise it's good, okay? I promise. 216 B.C., the Battle of Cannae. Okay, so this is in the midst of the Second Punic War. Rome and their mortal enemy, Carthage, a regional state in North Africa, were battling over control of the Western Mediterranean. And Hannibal, one of the generals of Carthage, was in Spain, and he made an army, gathered an army, and he invaded through southern France, and he crossed the Italian Alps with his uh, war elephants, and he invaded Italy, okay? Now, he beat two Roman armies at the Battle of Trebia and the Battle of Lake Trasimene, slaughtered them, okay? Now, Trebia is important because in the ancient world, in the ancient world, the orthodox way to make war was to, I get into a battle, I have my line infantry, and I take control of the center of the battlefield, and I break my enemy's lines, and I hold the center and work from the center out, okay? And although Hannibal won at Trebia, the Romans began to break through his lines. And they thought, if we just had more troops, if we had more training and more time, we can finally take Hannibal down. So they had Trebia on their mind for the future. So Hannibal is running rough all over Italy, burning stuff, uh, destroying things, you know, causing rebels to pop up. And he is in southeastern Italy at a place called Cannae. Okay? And so Rome raises their largest army ever, 86,000 troops, and allies. And they go out to meet Hannibal at Canaan. And Hannibal had like 40, maybe 50,000 troops. So he was strongly outnumbered by the Romans, okay? And so Hannibal sees his enemy and he thinks to himself, Who is my enemy? Who is my enemy? What are they thinking? What are their goals? What's the situation? He's responding to that. Hannibal's enemies think, We are Rome. This is the biggest Roman army ever assembled. We have the greatest line infantry in the, in the world. And we're going to grab a hold of that middle of the battlefield, and we're going to crush Hannibal's lines, and we're going to hold the center, and we're going to work out from there. And so Hannibal, because he knew his enemy thought, they're going to try to hold the center and crush us from the inside after the middle out. Okay, so thus begins the Battle of Cannae. Now, Hannibal had his cavalry race around the back of the Roman infantry, and they made war against the Roman cavalry. And this is away from the battle, okay? And Hannibal thought, I'm going to try to arrange my men in like an arc, an, an outward-oriented arc, and the arc will push them to the Roman lines, and then my cavalry is going to return and surround them, right? And the Romans will think that as I'm pushing into them, 
they're going to have the upper hand. They got stronger troops. They got more troops. But what's going to happen is I'm going to move against them, combat them, and then begin to retreat strategically in stages. And they'll think they're beating me. They'll think they're winning. But really, I'm surrounding them. And so this is what happens. The Romans hit the middle of the line. They go, ah, oh, we're hitting them hard. We got more troops. We got better troops. We're going to win this thing. Oh, look, they're retreating and moving back away from us. And meanwhile, Hannibal's making a giant arc inward. So now Rome in red is being surrounded by Hannibal's smaller army in the front and the left and the right. And the Romans begin seeing this and realizing, we got a problem here. And they turn around and see, and look who's coming. It's Hannibal's cavalry coming behind our lines. And now we're surrounded not on three sides. We're surrounded on four sides, every side. And the Battle of Cannae was the worst defeat in Roman history. 50,000 men were killed that day. 10, perhaps even 20,000 more were, became slaves, were prisoners. And Hannibal lost maybe five to 8,000 troops. And this all happened because of arrogance and the Roman leadership not understanding their enemy, not asking the right questions about the situation. And so when you don't ask the right questions about the situation, when you don't look at it the right way, you start to move, and your movement is all in the wrong direction. And so before you act, before you do, have faith. Faith for the Christian always precedes works. Who is God? Who is God in relation to me? What is my place in God's story? We see Abraham's place. He's the model of faith. What is your place? Now, lastly, point three, works succeed faith. Works succeed faith. Look at what you see here in the scripture, okay? Look at what you see in verse 11, okay? So Abraham received circumcision, an, an outward mark of his inner faith, as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. Okay, so Abraham believed God. His belief was given to him as a credit of righteousness. And then God, as a result of that, commanded other things for Abraham to do, like be circumcised. And Abraham obeyed, not separate from his faith, as an extension of his faith, because works succeed faith. A Christian's life has to start the right way, and then flow out from that right point. And that point is having faith in God in a true, sincere way in your heart. Okay, so if works succeed faith, now we know how to live. You live how you live because Jesus is your king. You live how you live because he is your great teacher. You live how you live because he is your savior. So your faith informs every decision that you make just like the reality of Hannibal being outnumbered, knowing how the Roman mind worked, knowing their urgency informed his decision-making at the Battle of Cannae. You have faith, which leads to works, because works succeed your faith. Now, I got a friend who sent me a picture recently, okay? And it's a joke picture, but it kind of looks like the ones that you see in, in a store, like a placard for your wall. It says like, you know, eat, pray, love, live, laugh, love, or like, you know, this house cries together, loves together, or, you know, laughs together, whatever. So anyway, but this placard actually has on there, it has the word I am enough written over and over and over again on it. And I saw it and I thought, dude, that is like so perfect for a sermon, okay? Now, this is not real to my understanding. It's, you know, it's been like uh, man manipulated, but here's the idea. In our world, people don't address the cause. We always address, often always, the symptom of the problem, right? And so I am enough, I am enough, I am enough. And if we say it enough, and if we think it enough, and if we act it enough, then we're going to somehow be enough. And that is the perspective of works I mean, a person of the flesh because you think that somehow you can do it on your own. Here's the truth. You aren't enough. You aren't enough. You're the problem. You have a problem in you. It is a sin problem. You bear it in your flesh. You bear it in your spirit. It's in your relationships. It, it is everywhere in your life. And so that isn't a bad thing to say. That's a great thing to say because it shows you who you really are. And if you understand how things really are, 
That's where the path can start for things to improve and get better. Okay, so you aren't enough. And so what I want to see as a pastor in church and everywhere else is, is that what I really do is always juggle about this. Like, it's kind of like I'm in sales, but I'm not in sales. Because when you're in sales, right, you do your job, you communicate, you do a little spiel or whatever, and somebody buys your product, right? When you're a pastor, it's kind of like you're in sales somewhat, but here's the difference. Um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get you to buy is something that, like, is just so difficult. I don't make any money because of it. Uh, I don't really have, like, like, a change in my life. What I'm asking for you, what I'm trying to get you to do is to, is to be changed from the inside out. So for you to, like, if you're playing, like, like if, you're, if you are playing c- c- cards, you have your chips and you go, I'm all in for you, God. So I'm trying to change who you are from the very core of your being, right? That's a pretty hard sales pitch. Wouldn't you agree? Maybe you don't agree. Maybe you think, Cal, it's so easy. Just keep doing it. You know, you're changing me. Here's the deal. What I want to see from you is life change, and I don't have the power to do it. The only thing that has the power to do it is the plan, the work, and the purposes of God. That's it. That's all I got as a pastor. And so I get up here and I go, you have access to God by faith. You are saved by faith. Faith precedes works, anything you do, but then your life, your works, succeed from your sincere, heart-changed Christian faith. And that is all being a Christian is at its core. And I think when you do that, when I do that, we do that, our world will change in just a tremendous way. When we live as authentic, passionate, true Christians, it just takes having the simple, honest faith like Abraham had. So Abraham is the model for Christian faith. And may he be a model for you and a model for me. Now, I'm going to close this in prayer, okay? I'm going to close this in prayer. And after I pray, I'll be at the front for a hot minute, okay? And if you have any questions about this message, if you have anything on your heart that God's put on your heart, come talk to me. I want to help you learn how to be a Christian, address any problems or sins you have in your life. I want you to have the hope that I have from believing in Jesus and realizing that he will give you a new heart. He will change you from the inside out. So let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much for this chance to um, to preach these great truths out of Romans chapter 4. And so all I want for myself, God, all I want for everyone here, everybody watching online, is I want them to um, know and to experience life change. It's not anything that they do. It's not kind of any kind of effort they have, Lord. It simply comes from believing in what you did for them, believing in the gospel, believing in the change that comes from what Jesus, what he did for them so long ago. He did this for David. He did it for Abraham. He did it for all of us. And so I just pray we can grab onto this and realize that you want our lives. You want us from the inside out. And if anybody here has questions about being a Christian or what it means to be a part of a church, I'll be at the front for a bit. Lord, if you're watching online and you have any kind of compulsion about what I've spoken about this morning, it's God telling you to speak to a counselor. Reach out into the chat room and we'll help you out, okay? I pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Be sure to drop us a like, subscribe, and follow us on social media so you don't miss any future DC Church content.